All right, so, um, Roll20 tutorial campaign. We're learning how to use Roll20. In the last video, we made our Roll20 uh, adventure, our campaign. So now we're going to jump in and start exploring it. So we're going to click on Launch Game. All right, so... Here we are in the game for the first time. Uh, you can see that everything is super basic. We've got a white background with gray lines. It's a grid. There's nothing here. Uh, let's take a quick tour of what's going on. Over here on the left-hand side is your toolbar. These are the tools that will help you as you do your stuff. Uh, along the top of the screen, you look over here, there is a blue ribbon looking thing hanging down. This is your page toolbar. Your uh, Roll20 game is made up of a number of pages. I also call them maps, um, because usually that's what they are. Um, you can see that by default, you have one start page, and there is this magic red ribbon labeled Players. This determines what the players are going to see, which page they're on, which map they're on. Uh, so that is that interface. Uh, over here is this zoom bar. Uh, there are hotkeys to control this, but we do need to turn those hotkeys on. Uh, you'll notice hiding right here is the little ribbon uh, kind of poking out here. It looks like it would open up a menu because it has a little hamburger menu icon, but that's not what it does. If you click on it, it hides your tools. This is especially useful if you want to take like a sweet screenshot and you want to get the um, chat out of the way. But other than that, it doesn't really have any function so we're going to click on it and pull everybody back out uh on that note you can using you know frames or whatever uh, make your chat box really fat and big i don't know why you would do that or small um kind of adjust the size there as needed so over here on the chat box side of things uh you've got chat uh which is the chat area this is the little area where you type chat down at the bottom uh so i don't know Bam, it shows up in chat. Um, it shows up as the person that you are, which is kind of neat. Uh, this is a uh, flyout list menu that will be populated with every character or character-like thing. So templates, and monsters, um, stuff like that, that you have control over will eventually get populated here. Um, and it's interesting because your player name will appear here, but also character names will appear here. And... Whatever is selected here is what will show up in chat. This is useful if you run a more text-based game or you, in, you have a large group and you encourage your players to chat in-game. That way they can continuously chatter at each other in-game, in-character, without talking over you, the DM, or whatever player is currently in the spotlight. Uh, another nice side effect of playing online is that you have that sort of ability to constantly chatter in the background without rudely talking over the people that are already there or just being kind of a murmur in the background. So that's a pretty cool feature. Uh, you can emote uh, in um, chat by doing a slash me and then uh, emotes emotionally. There we go. And then it gets a different color, and it shows up italics, and bam, Crash Gem emotes emotionally. So that's slash ME to, to add that in there. So chat, pretty cool. There's more features of chat, but we're doing a general tour of the interface. So here we go. Uh, the next thing looks like a stack of pictures. You mouse over it, it says it's the art library. The art library has two different sections. They have a your library, which is full of art that you have uploaded. Uh, and free art that the internet has provided their search tool. Uh, or there is a premium assets over here, and these are things that you have purchased in the marketplace or that were included with your subscription or that were included for free as part of some kind of cool uh, event that you took place in or Roll20 just gave them out one day and you snagged them. Um, pretty neat stuff. So between uh, your marketplace purchases and your library and the search tool, you should be able to find a lot of cool stuff. So that's what this is for. It's for sorting and finding your art assets. Now I say sorting, but I'm going to be honest. The interface uh, for all of this is... Um, okay, they added some folders. That's kind of cool. Um, so 
it's a little bit better than it was before, maybe. Um, but yeah, this is basically where you can kind of start renaming things easier, um, you know, dragging and dropping and moving stuff around. I don't know. That's the sorting area. So I access that by double clicking on any of my assets here. Okay, then we've got uh, the journal tab. Journal tab looks like a newspaper. For those of you who don't know, a newspaper is something that you use uh, at the bottom of your cat box. Uh, before you put the litter in, you put down newspaper. Uh, I think you can also use it in like a hamster cage. Um, yeah, so that's what a newspaper is. So I don't know why they chose it for the journal, but there it is. Uh, this is where all of the everything lives for your campaign. So your handouts, your character sheets, your monster sheets, all that stuff is going to live in journal. Next to that, there is a circle with an I in it. The I stands for compendium, question mark. Uh, and you can see D&D 5th edition. There's a search thing. There is all these headers. Uh, the more money you spend at Roll20.net, uh, the better your compendium is going to be. So I could type in something like uh, Dragonborn. You know, if I learned how to spell. Hold on. Uh, Dragonborn. Dragonbjorn. Maybe. There we go. Um, so you can see that this one is from Wild Mounts. This one's from the Player's Handbook. Uh, this one's from Wildmount. Uh, this one's from Xanthar's Guide. So the more um, stuff you have uh, unlocked v with money, um, the more features and the more robust your compendium is going to be. Uh, you can even see I've got monsters down here from the CC, which is the Creature Compendium from Kobold Press. Honestly, buying monster manuals is one of the smarter things you could do with your roll 20 money so definitely consider that so that's the compendium compendium is very very useful then you've got jukebox so jukebox used to be amazing amazing jukebox is not amazing anymore um jukebox is pretty bad i'm just gonna put it out there um i use groovy via um discord and i love it and i can't I can't endorse anything else at this time. Um, I've tried some other programs for audio via um, rolling or running a roll twenty game. I can't really, I can't really recommend it. If you insist on using Jukebox, uh, you go into here and you can upload music yourself uh, from your computer. You have a certain amount that you can upload before you run out of room, essentially. Um, you can also go to tracks and they do have a library of good songs um, and sound effects through tabletop audio, battle bards, and in Competech. So if you are just dipping your toes into music and sound, uh, not bad to give Jukebox uh, a chance, kind of, uh, you know, fiddle around and uh, try stuff out and see what, you, see what you come up with. I mean, these are by no means bad songs uh, or sound effects. They, some of them are some of them are really really nice, um, you know. So you can explore it, that kind of thing. But jukebox is how Roll Twenty handles in-game sound effects and music. Mm. Next up, we have collection. So collection's a weird name. Um, I guess it's better than miscellaneous. But this is where your macros live. Any decks that you might have. Uh, because, yes, you have fully interactive uh, decks that you can use in Roll20, which is awesome. I have some decks that I like to use, critical hit decks and um, treasure decks and things like that. Um, you can also just, you know, a hey, deck of many things. They can actually draw from it digitally. That's kind of neat. Um, so, yeah, that's... Uh, decks we're not going to cover that in this video um rollable tables i have a video for that but they're really cool they can be used for a lot of different things one of the things that can be used for is um miniatures that change form which is kind of cool and then macros macros are just uh good time saving things they can do stuff like roll initiative by just selecting a miniature and then clicking an initiative button um they can automate attacks they can do all sorts of cool stuff so um, they're like a step below API scripts. Uh, macros are um, a useful automation tool, but not as complicated as API scripting. 
All right, uh, and then finally we have settings. So, a couple things here for the DM. Uh, you can exit your game. You can rejoin as a player. This could be useful if you want to test a map out and see what it would be like as a player. Uh, it can also be useful if you are sharing a Roll20 uh, game or accounts with uh, a bunch of people and you um, go to join this game and you are supposed to be a player and not a DM or you get really good at Roll20 and you offer to help a friend set up their game. They make you a GM, you go in, you help them with some stuff and then you, um, you want to rejoin and play as a player. So it's a cool feature to have there. Uh, what is display name? Display name changes the name that will be displayed in Roll20. Um, it's often uh, a really nice thing to do is leave your handle or username, but put your character name. So I might put chamomile and then slash crash gem and then save it. This means people will see that, oh, Crash Gem is Chamomile, Chamomile is Crash Gem, and especially if you're not using web cameras or anything, it can help people learn which player is which character. Um, very useful if you're playing with a group that's never played together before or doesn't recognize each other's voices very easily. I feel like that's a best practice situation is to do character name slash player name so that you're providing as much information as possible. Um, if your group is super comfortable, they know everybody's name, they know everybody's voice, uh, they don't need that, you could just drop it, just put your character name. The cool thing about this is it doesn't change your Roll20 handle, it just changes how you are displayed in the game itself, which is nice. Uh, underneath that is the master volume. This is if you are using Jukebox, it will allow you to change how loud uh, it is for you personally. So every player should have their own volume knob that they can come and mess with. Uh, underneath that is use advanced keyboard shortcuts. I would recommend turning this on. Um, more than likely, as I explain stuff, I will be using hotkeys out of habit, so it's probably better that you have this turned on. So when I say, and then I hit this key, um, the reason that that key actually works is because I went to my settings and I turned on my hotkeys. Now, double-edged sword, the tricky thing about hotkeys is sometimes you activate them on accident. Uh, so just be mindful that if something wonky starts happening, you may have hit a hotkey that you don't know about. How do you learn more about hotkeys? There's a little I here that stands for information this time. And if you click on it, it will open in a new uh, window, and that new window will uh, kind of give you a list of all of the different shortcut keys and hotkeys that are available in Roll20, of which there are a lot. And unfortunately for me, um, they do not duplicate any of the functionality of, say, Photoshop or some other program where I know all the hotkeys. Uh, I've been using this for a long time, and there's still hotkeys that I don't know. So underneath that, there's the option to make window pop-outs for characters. Uh, for windowed pop-outs for characters, that's kind of cool. We'd need an actual character sheet to show you how it works. So for now, we're just going to leave that off. Um, honestly, it's a cool feature, but it can sort of be annoying if you're trying to use Compendium uh, alongside of it. Uh, there are hotkeys that can make stuff pop out. Uh, so... You might just leave this one alone. Uh, enabled background chat beep. Uh, basically, this means as people are typing into chats, this will make notification noises to uh, let you know that people have been using chat. This can be very useful if, as the DM, you are role-playing real hard or you are in a different map than the players getting things together and not paying attention to chat. You are over here... Uh, looking through journals or looking through the compendium, it will let you know, hey, people are using chat so that you can go back and check chat and make sure you don't miss any comments that might have been made uh, or whispered tells that came to you, that sort of thing. Uh, enable advanced dice, dice icons, drag and drop, etc. Um, I don't know. I mean, kind of cool, but honestly, I don't think it's uh, necessary um like for example if i just click and hit that right i just roll and it's good so um i guess just leave it alone for now um if we go to enable 3d dice uh what this does is when i go to roll a die 
Oh, yeah. So, by default, if I go to roll a die, a 3D die, it says click and drag to roll the dice. This seems kind of fun at first because it's like, hey, it's like real life. I'm using my hand to make the dice move. Um, and as a player, maybe that's fun. But as a DM who has to roll about 40,000 dice every D&D &D session, uh, it's going to get real annoying to constantly have the screen flash gray and tell you that you have to click and drag to roll dice. So that's where I would say turn this feature off. Now that this is off with my 3D dice, I will click it. Hmm, why is it still asking me to do this? Let's see. Yeah. Oh, okay, they changed it here. So here where it says disabled, I'm just going to disable that. And so now when I click it, there we go. It's just going to go ahead and roll the dice. All right, now 3D dice are cool. It's super cool, especially when you drop like a big old fat like 20d6 fire damage from like a trap or a super fireball or something, right? Look at all those dice they appeared on the table automatically rolled them and calculated and that's awesome um some players are playing on like the oldest crappiest computer they have they're they're playing on like a phablet they're you know god forbid trying to play on their phone or something um 3d dice are gonna mess them up uh pretty bad so um if they have 3d dice turned on and they're complaining about the game running really slow definitely counsel them to turn their 3D dice off. Uh, 3D dice have been known to cause some performance issues with certain machines. So um, anytime you start having performance issues, that's one of the first things you should check is, do you have 3D dice turned on? Um, enabled chat uh, avatars, I would leave that on. Yeah, so basically that means that when you chat, a uh, little picture appears next to your chat which is cute and fun and all that good stuff. Um, Timestamps, not really that important, but I guess you can turn them on if you want to. It just kind of clutters your chat. Um, alphabetically sorting tokens is fantastic. I would leave that turned on. Uh, enabled animated graphics. Basically, this allows you to use like animated GIFs, uh, which is kind of cool. Um, don't go crazy with the animated GIFs. Again, performance issues. Chrome is already a resource hog. Um, Firefox, less so. But um, you don't want to push it. Um, so, you know, a couple of animated textures or animated spell effects or animated miniatures once in a while is cool. But going all in on animated at this time, at the time of this video, um, probably not the best idea. All right. Uh, and then they have options for changing how scroll and pan work, uh, which is kind of cool. So um, depending on your accessibility needs, you can change um, how scrolling works. So I think by, I want to say by default, it is a secondary click to pan anytime. Yeah, so if I hold down the right mouse button, I can just sort of uh, pan around the map, which is pretty cool. And then if I hold down Alt and use the mouse wheel, I can scroll in and out. Um, yeah, so pretty neat. Um, if your users do not have a mouse because they're on a phablet or a laptop or something like that, um, they'll obviously want to change um, what buttons do what uh, to match their particular device and play style. So um, down here, uh, we've got, uh, you can change the color of your game settings uh, for tokens. We don't need to worry about that right now. You can mess with the deck uh, of cards. We don't really need to mess with that right now. Chat avatar, um, disable speaking as avatar. What does that mean? So when you're not broadcasting video, this is all video stuff down here. Now, um, maybe you wanna do video and that's cool. Um, I will be honest, I've found that uh, I've run into a lot of problems trying to get voice and video to work through Roll20. I, again, I run five, games a week. I've been running games on Roll20 for five years. Uh, I've run games for, I don't know, like a hundred different people at this point. I'm going to tell you right now that I've had the most tech issues trying to get chat slash video to work through Roll20. Um, just use Discord. Just use Discord for chat. Um, if you are like Google people, just use Google Meet or Google Hangouts uh, for chat. And video don't bother um, 
messing around with the roll 20 stuff just gonna put it out there um it's if you have a tech savvy group you guys could probably get it to work but I'm not going to cover it in this video in fact my recommendation uh is to scroll all the way down to where it says video and audio chat and i'm just going to say none and turn it off uh because i use discord and that's my recommendation uh for you and then it will refresh my browser and my roll 20 to accommodate for that change now what else uh can you do now that all of those options have been removed, I can go here and do player avatar size. And uh, you can change it to be large. Um, you can change it to be uh, regular, small, or just the name. Now, recently, I believe they made it so that you can move uh, icons around the screen. Uh, maybe? Is that not a thing you can do anymore? Hmm. All right, I could have sworn you could move them around the screen. Um, I I think they're fun for sure. Uh, definitely leave it up to your players what you want to do. When I'm DMing, I want to be able to see as much of the map as possible. So for me, for, for DMing, I normally just do names only. Um, so, it, you know, it just changes uh, to be just a name. And that gives me more room to see what's going on. All right, uh, down here at the bottom, we've got uh, some experimental features. The top one worth mentioning, but not going into is Transmog. This is a feature of a pro account. If you do end up playing a lot of Roll20, uh, Dungeons & Dragons, Transmog is amazing. It allows you to transfer assets from one campaign to another. So if you build an amazing map and you want to reuse that map, you don't have to build the map all over again. You could just take it from one game and move it to another game. Extremely useful feature. So those are the settings, those are the interface options. The last thing to discuss here is um, your nameplate over here. Uh, you see how it has blue there? You can click on that and you could pick any color you want. And if you know what hex codes are, you could punch in any hex codes you want and that will change your associated color. What feature could that possibly affect that would be worth anything? It changes the color of your dice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so definitely show your players that they can change the color of their dice because that will definitely help some of the analog players feel a bit more comfortable playing in Rule 20. So we have explored the basic interface. Uh, in our next video, we are going to set up a starting page for our campaign. So I will catch you in the next video.